Library's Science and Society Lecture Series, Making Sense of the World Around Us. My name is Rebecca Lowe. I'm the Adult Program Coordinator with the Lewis Public Library, and thank you for joining us this evening. This lecture series is co-organized and moderated by Fred Dilla, Executive Director Emeritus of the American Institute of Physics and the author of Scientific Journeys. Linda Dilla, former Public Information Officer at the Jefferson Laboratory and the U.S. Department of Energy, and Colin Norman, the former news editor at Science. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Linda. Thank you. Linda, remember to unmute yourself. Hi, everybody. It is a real honor for me to introduce Rox, who's a friend as well as a colleague. Fred and I have, Fred's known him since uh, college at MIT. Again, we're dropping the MIT name. Sorry, that just seems to be what happens. Rox and Fred did physics together there. And then Rox taught high school physics for quite a while before he decided to go back and get his um, medical degree. And he ended up going all the way through with some technical stuff on the laser side, as well as becoming a specialty in dermatology. He's got every award known to man and has quite a few patents that he'll talk about. And some of them are really important to children who have burns and scars, port wine stain removal, tattoo removal, the list goes on and on and we'll stop there. And he's also the guy that took the first thing off the top of Fred's head and called me and said, you just saved your husband's life, but he has melanoma. So he's the one who put the team together at Mass General that saved Fred's life, including the immunology, immunotherapy that went along with it. So I'll stop there and let Rox talk. And I hope you enjoy it as much as we enjoy him. Well, hi, uh, thank you for that <laughs> glowing introduction, uh, Linda and Fred. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, as as one of my old friends says, it's really nice to be seen as opposed to be being viewed. So <clears throat> I'm going to jump right in here. Um, let's see if we. I need to screen share, right? Okay, let's try this. Can you all see? Yeah, looks good. Okay, so first off, um, uh, so I'm a professor of uh, dermatology at Harvard Medical School, and I take care of kids. Um, I'm a pediatric uh, dermatologist, but I also take care of adults who want to look like kids again, all right? So that's the kind of the nature of my practice. And I thought what I would do tonight is just start with some natural things. You know, we evolved under the sun, and that really set us up in many ways for how we respond to light. And then I'll end by talking about some modern laser surgery and some really recent stuff. Um, so by gosh, this is the sun. We have spent billions of years evolving under this, first as single cells and then multicellular organisms, plants, and then us animals. Um, actually, the animals kind of came first, <laughs> and the plants and animals evolved together. And uh, we don't really understand everything about how the sun affects us. So that's one of my main messages to you. But we'll start with this. We vision, all right? We, it's interesting. It's probably an accident, but I'm not so sure that our human visual system peaks at in the green part of the spectrum, which is exactly where we get the most sunlight. Um, so we're pretty good photoreceptors there. And if you look at the spectrum of light that's shown in this slide can you guys you can see this point little dinky pointer i have yeah okay so there's ultraviolet light that's short wavelengths that you don't see there's visible light which is actually a very small slice of what the sun gives out and then there's infrared light which is on the long wavelength side we don't see that either so the uh, human visual system we have basically three sets of receptors in our retina and it's the ratios of blue green and red that give us our beautiful color vision and it's interesting all the nearly infinite number of colors that we see are really just ratios of three primary colors this is why you can make a, a television 
with RGB, right? Red, green, blue, and display all human perceptible colors within it. Our blue receptors, though, have some special purpose. Um, it turns out that there are non-imaging receptors in your retina. There's a lot of light reception going on that has nothing to do with what you can see. It has to do with entraining our circadian response, we, our sleep-wake cycles. And in the bottom half of your retina are blue light receptors that are literally looking at the sky. They're only asking the question, is the sky blue? When the sky is no longer blue, they signal in your brain to produce melatonin, which is the big signal for you to go to sleep. Our, you can imagine what I'm going to say, which is that our modern life ruins that. It's uh, getting dark in Boston. Here I am under these bright lights, right? Um, so if you, one of the first things I'd say is just to, um, you know, for better sleep and better mood, um, during the active part of the day, expose yourself to lots of bright light. You're supposed to, you know, be doing that. Avoid bright screens uh, and bright lights within a few hours of bedtime. Um, around your house, use warm dimming um, lights. The world has switched to LEDs, which are much more efficient. That's good for global warming, et cetera. Um, but many of them refuse to go red when you dim them. And they, they, you can find uh, home lighting that uh, when you dim it down does, does red shift. And then I went around my house and I actually eliminated all of the blue and green little pilot lights that are all over the place. They're just telling you that something is on. Um, either get rid of them or turn them into somehow red pilot lights. And consider wearing blue blocking goggles uh, at, at night. Um, what about the ultraviolet part of the spectrum? If you look on this slide, you can see people have divided ultraviolet light into A, B, and C. And most people are aware of that. UVA, UVB um, are marching on into the shorter wavelengths of the UV spectrum. Now, according to Planck's law, the shorter wavelengths uh, carry more energy per photon. So the quantum energy is higher. And when that uh, quantum is absorbed by biological molecules, there's a much higher probability of some chemistry happening, basically bake, breaking uh, or making bonds. So it's the UV part of the spectrum that's most active in, in that. Uh, UVC is not here on Earth. It's absorbed by the ozone layer. UVB is kind of bad for you. I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, it makes vitamin D, but you're better off eating your vitamin D. I recommend salmon. Um, a sustainable fish that's loaded with vitamin D, but you can also get tons of it from mushrooms only if you put the mushrooms in the sunlight. So you go to the grocery store, you buy your mushrooms, stick them out in the sun for 10 minutes, and all of a sudden those mushrooms become much better for you. Uh, they do the same chemistry that we do in our skin for making vitamin D. But the UVB causes uh, skin cancer and it makes you look too old too soon. Right? That's the wrinkling and sagging wavelengths. On the co in contrast, and this I'm I'm a bit of a radical dermatologist in this regard. UVA is kind of good for you. It does cause tanning, but without much cancer risk. And Richard Weller, a friend of mine in Britain, uh, did an exhaustive study looking at at uh, longevity of humans across planet earth and actually if you get moderate uva and blue light exposures it, it it lengthens our lifespans and it's not a small effect it's a significant effect uh, almost as much as smoking but in the opposite direction makes you live longer um, so in fact window glass is your friend uh, window glass is perfect it blocks out the uvb it lets the uva invisible through you go to the restaurant for lunch pick the sunny seat uh, south facing window and you'll get your, you know, 20 minutes or so. If you, if you get that 20 or minutes or so of sunlight through a window, uh, it has a significant effect on, on longevity. 
UVA blocking sunscreens are getting really popular. And I, I think people have sort of gone over the uh, edge and being afraid of every part of the sun. It's just not the way to, that we should be. So I, I look for UVB blocking sunscreens and not UVA ones. What about the infrared? Uh, the other longer wavelength, lower energy photons. Um, when absorbed, infrared tends to cause uh, vibrational modes, exc exciting molecules, not by breaking their bonds, but by making them move. So people think of it as causing heat, but in fact, it does have the ability to change bonds at a low energy. And until recently, we thought that infrared really didn't affect humans, um, but we were wrong and we were really wrong. This is one of the things I'm studying in our lab right now. So I'll, I'll dwell on it a little bit. If you just step back and you look at life on planet Earth, we have plants and we have animals. And the, I'm showing you in a cartoon fashion here what's called a eukaryotic plant. That's a higher order plant that has a nucleus with its DNA and genes in it. Um, but it also has these photosynthetic organelles called chloroplasts. That's where the, the chlorophyll is sunlight is received by the plant and it uses that uh, to make glucose. It takes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, releases oxygen and makes glucose that it uses for the cellulose, basically the body and the energy of the plant. On the animal side of this story, uh, here's a eukaryotic animal cell. We have a nucleus. By the way, those chloroplasts are probably early in evolution. Those are probably single cell algae that were captured as a, you know, as a symbiote, all right? And we have a similar story. We have these things called mitochondria in every cell of your body, just about, um, has mitochondria in it. And it's doing the dead opposite of what photosynthesis does. It's taking oxygen and glucose and making an energetic molecule called ATP that we use for the cell energy to do biochemistry and so forth. So plants and animals kind of need each other. I mean, you might look at a salad and think, oh, gee, you know, I'm a predatory. <laughs> it, if the plant could talk, it'd be looking at you and saying, you're a great fertilizer, buddy. Um, so it, it, the gas exchange that goes on between oxygen and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is, has evolved to a, a point of balance. Uh, you know, we're upsetting that balance now by releasing a lot of CO2. Um, but it, it's interesting, these mitochondria back in the 1930s when people were first figuring out what's inside of cells, they found these mitochondria and they knew that they absorbed light. And in fact, that's they're loaded with something called cytochrome, which if you break that word down, cyto, cell, chrome, color, the color of a cell. So it raises this question, okay, they absorb light. Is that light doing anything to us? And I think it's, I love this slide, little cartoon slide, because it shows the sort of in interdependence and synergy and also symmetry uh, of this web of life on Earth. Well, it turns out that indeed, light really does affect the cytochromes and the energy uh, metabolism in, in our cells. Um, this is a complicated drawing. Don't worry too much about it. Um, the cytochrome system has, by the way, the, the reason you have lungs and a heart is to bring oxygen, O2, to this exact site inside your mitochondria. That is where the magic happens. The oxygen is split, it releases water, pumps some ions across the membrane, and those ions are then used to drive this machinery that makes the ATP. How does this furnace, if you will, it's burning fuel with oxygen, how does it regulate itself? Well, there is a, a local um, enzyme that makes nitric oxide. And the nitric oxide competes with oxygen for this binding site. 
So mitochondria are like a sports car that doesn't have an accelerator. It only has a brake. And the nitric oxide is like putting the brakes on the rate of respiration here. What is it that light does? It's quite interesting. Um, light releases nitric oxide from that site that inhibits the rate at which the cells are breathing. And uh, nitric oxide is a odd molecule. There are a couple of Nobel Prizes given for discovering this stuff. Um, locally, it's controlling the rate of respiration of cells. But if the cells are under stress, particularly oxidative or hypoxic stress, meaning that there's not enough oxygen to go around, that happens with stroke, it happens with heart attack, it even heart happens just with vigorous exercise. Um, you, you run toward an anaerobic state. The, the blood vessels release a lot of nitric oxide and it actually shuts down the mitochondria so that it's a, not a good trade-off in some ways. What light is doing is allowing the cells to breathe even though they're in the setting of relatively low oxygen levels. And that's kind of what's going on with this process. It's very useful. To, re to rescue cells under stress. Uh, we just completed a bunch of studies here. We took people who have had traumatic brain injury, mostly from car accidents and sports injuries, and shined light through their skulls and showed that we could increase the rate of the brain's healing after trauma using nothing but near-infrared light. Muscle strength and endurance. Uh, I have a grant right now from the Department of Defense. They really want people to run faster and be uh, have higher endurance. And sure enough, I'll show you an example of that here. We have in the lab, we've got mice running on treadmills. And the little mouse down at the bottom didn't get treated. The little mouse up at the top did. And this guy on the bottom is losing it. This little thing back here is a stimulator for his tail. Um, we literally have marathon mice here. We're not harming these animals, by the way. We're just making them run faster. Um, it works well for chronic inflammation and even for pain uh, control. So <clears throat> it's interesting that... Uh, you know, here's the 49ers. They're going to the Super Bowl. That may not be an accident, right? They, uh, the the 40 San Francisco 49ers uh, recently announced that they do this routinely um, before every game. They stimulate their players with uh, near infrared light. So um, this is a really complicated slide, and I don't want you to read it. I'm just saying there's a ton of evidence that's very interesting stuff about how you can use near infrared light without drugs as a way of rescuing uh, even humans under stress, traumatic brain injury, heart attacks. So uh, there's some work going on now for neurodegenerative diseases. This is a, a, a helmet that emits light that we put on. This is what we studied for the traumatic brain injury. And about 3% of these wavelengths actually go right, right smack through your head. Right? So you can get uh, effects that are deep inside the body. I thought I would, this is really for Fred. He, I know Fred, he likes to see real data. Um, so if you look at where in the spectrum are these most effective wavelengths, there's red and near infrared light that are uh, effective. And the wavelengths that are effective correspond to that absorption of the cytochrome system. Uh, this was studied long ago by a Russian uh, phys uh, physician actually named Tina Karu. And she, nobody believed her at first. I have huge respect for her because she stayed the course and really was an example of just sticking with it to get something good done. Uh, now my machine's not letting me go forward. Oh yeah, okay. So here's the wavelengths that are that are useful. But guess what? We very recently discovered yet another one from an entirely different mechanism. Near infrared light interacts with the same receptors that red pepper goes for. Right? And the interaction of these wavelengths seems to be very important for, for in humans again for pain control. Um, 
there was, uh, I think it was the year before last, Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded for the discovery of these channels. And it's quite interesting to me that you can directly talk to neurons also with near infrared light. I'm gonna shift gears and talk about like more what I've spent my time doing, which is using lasers to help people um, I think we all have an understanding at some level of what lasers are, very powerful, potentially very powerful sources of light. Um, in this case, enough to do surgery, enough to affect the tissue. Short pulses are possible, very, very short pulses of light. And when you concentrate that energy, bang, you get all these uh, other effects, not just heating things up, but uh, making them explode and things. You can focus lasers to a narrow spot and that allows you to do really neat imaging um, and uh, be super precise. Uh, you can focus them into a fiber optic and then that means you can deliver lots of light deep inside the body um, in ways that we never have been able to do until recently. And lasers are also, they typically are at a very well-defined wavelength, which allows you to kind of pick a wavelength that's absorbed by some target molecule and therefore have selective effects. Um, the light is coherent. It's, this is hard to explain. It's kind of like the light waves are all in unison, sort of like soldiers marking, marching exactly in unison, where the front soldier steps forward with the left foot, the back soldier does too. Um, and that allows for imaging and holograms and, and so forth. Many years ago, I first got interested in this stuff because I wanted to help children uh, who had these vascular birthmarks called port wine stains. And um, it, I'll show you some examples of that. It's about one in 300 people that are born with this. We understand something about the genetics, but a lot of it is random. So these are spontaneous mutations and they'll probably be going on forever in the human race. What happens is that they, they have this abnormally dilated small vessels in the skin, which over time continue to dilate. And if untreated, you can get into a big mess like this. This is an extreme case of a 60 year old who never got treated for his port wine stain. Here's one of my patients who let me show this picture with his permission. He was treated with old technologies. He's blind from glaucoma in this eye because he was not, his, his port wine stain wasn't treated when he was a youngster. And so he had high pressure there. He's got skin cancer from having inappropriate x-ray treatment to try and get rid of it. And he's got burn scars from an old inappropriate laser, the argon laser before people knew what was going on. And that's, that's when I started working on this long ago. If you look at what's inside the skin, there's all this stuff, you know? I mean, it's, it's a real wonderful, diverse ecosystem inside, just in your skin, your whole body is like this. And, the only part that's sort of wrong in the Port Weinstein are the post-capillary veins that return blood to your heart. They are dilated. They don't have sufficient smooth muscle tone, so they, they become saccular. And I came up with this idea of, of select, we called it selective photothermolysis, which is just a long-term way of saying you choose a wavelength that's absorbed by this target and then you can have a selective effect. So in this cartoon, here's the blood vessels down here inside the skin. You have to get the light through the tan part of your skin that's called the epidermis. And you come in with a pulse of light and damage just the blood vessels because that's where the light was absorbed. That's where the heat is created. And if you do that in the right way, you get both selective heating, selective damage, and selective repair. To do this, um, it started with just a theory, like, oh, let's choose this wavelength and stuff. But there wasn't a laser. There was no laser at that wavelength. Uh, at a, a yellow wavelength associated with this absorption by your blood. And so I got together with this guy, Horace Furumoto, is a very good physicist. He's not around anymore with us, but we many years ago built the very first pulsed dye laser 
specifically to help these kids. And it was the first example of building a laser for medicine. Before that, all of the lasers were kind of taken from industry and other things. Um, later on, we started using other lasers, Alexandrite lasers, absorbed selectively by the deoxyhemoglobin in your blood that's present only in those abnormal veins. So we could get even more selective, not selective just for blood vessels, but for exactly the part of the circulation that was abnormal. And now here's one of my very first patients. Uh, this girl actually graduated from Yale recently. That's how old we are. <laughs> Here she is as a one-year-old. And after some treatments with an early version of the pulse dye laser, a very nice result. She also has high pressure in her eye, but we saved her eye. She also has brain involvement, but we mitigated that. And this kid is just totally different than that old guy I showed you. We also, using this deeper penetrating Alexandrite laser, can help the adults that have these more darker and you know, hypertrophic so-called, sorry, I shouldn't use that, you know, sort of uh, expanded port wine stains if we can help them as well. Um, so that was my entree into using, you know, building lasers that are selective somehow. And I thought I would show you just something that's very recent um, that I've been working on here using essentially the same laser but for a totally, with a different strategy and a different disease. So this is neurofibromatosis. You may have heard of this. There was a movie made long ago called The Elephant Man about a, a man who had neurofibromatosis. This is the most common human genetic disease, number one, where you can point to a gene and say, ah, you have a disease because of this gene in your DNA being abnormal. Um, the reason for that is that the neurofibromin gene is like the size of a barn. It's a huge gene, and the probability of having a functional defect in that is high just because of its size. Um, the kids are born looking pretty normal, and uh, we know that they've got this disease. They've got some telltale signs. But what happens over time is this, the skin tumors grow. And over 90% of the people who have this most common human genetic disease are studded with skin tumors by the time they're about 30 years old. And it's a devastating thing for them. The tumors are painful, they're itchy. They don't kill you. The patients have a pretty normal lifespan. Um, they do have other problems, seizure disorders and stuff. But what happens in their skin is a huge social challenge for them. Um, high suicide rates and things like that. So I began to work very recently. Oh, by the way, our treatment for this, I'm embarrassed by this. I'm embarrassed that I'm an old guy that's been seeing patients for years and didn't get around to this one until recently. Um, the treatment is basically when the tumors are large enough to cut off with surgery, we take people to the operating room and do surgery, but it's extremely expensive. It's You get lots of scarring, and they had to go through all those uh, social trauma of looking like this to begin with. So recently began to ask the question, is there a way of inhibiting the early small tumors that grow during the entire life of these people? And here's just a simple idea that worked well. We took the same laser, the Alexandrite laser, that's capable of selectively targeting little blood vessels. And here the magic, so to speak, if there is any, is, is a really simple thing. When you, when you squeeze these tumors, they're extremely squishy. They're, they're like a soft sponge. They don't feel the same um, firmness of the normal skin. So we got the idea of putting just a little bit of suction on the skin, about half an atmosphere or so. And what happens is the, the tumor is, is so soft that the blood vessels in it are allowed to expand. It's just like the port wine stain now. You've got these big plump 
juicy, so to speak, <laughs> blood vessels that feed the tumor. And then you hit them really hard with a laser pulse that uh, denies the tumor of a blood supply, killing it. Here's what it looks like in our studies. We just published this. This is two months ago we published this for the first time uh, in a dermatology journal here. Uh, so adults were our subjects to start with for ethical reasons are, are, are adults. We're not going to attack children with something that hasn't been proven yet. And uh, you see this immediate, in this case, there's only five of these that were treated in small tumors. Immediate change in the color, you're basically causing the blood to be coagulated. And then over about three months, the tumors either die, they regress completely or they regress partially. And uh, I'm very excited by this. I think that we can possibly come up with a good treatment for the kids that have this disease. Um, this laser is pretty fast. I can treat 10 tumors a minute like this. So even though, you know, I showed you that woman with a thousand tumors, you know, that's only a hundred minutes for me. I mean, so you can get the job done. And, um, for those of you that are interested, I don't know this. This was a long time ago. This was back when I was a young man. Okay, um, there's. I wrote a paper in Science that kind of describes all this. This just this idea of of using wavelengths of light to go after specific targets. This is the basis. I've showed you two examples for blood vessels. It's actually a. a the most common laser treatment now for glaucoma, um, hair removal, laser hair removal, which I'll show you about, pigmented cells, and new that I'll talk about right at the end is treating acne, which Fred had something to do with. So some of those examples are here. If you want to do laser hair removal, the thing to target is the melanin. That's the pigment that makes our hair brown or black. Uh, this doesn't work, by the way, if your hair is white or blonde. Um, so it's interesting that in the hair, here's the skin, the epidermis again, here's the dermis, that's the thick sort of leathery part of your skin. The hair follicles that make the hair, they're alive, but the hair shaft is not. Hair shaft is dead. The hair shaft is actually made way down at the bottom of your skin by the living part of the hair making machinery. And that is heavily pigmented with melanin. So you can do this thing where you cool the surface of the skin to protect it. And then you come along with a pulse of light that's intended to knock out the factory that makes the hair. And there's some stem cells that are involved. Um, this. Uh, also, it's very interesting, the, the hair shaft absorbs the light, but the living part of the hair is all around the hair shaft. So we had to, it took us a while to figure this out, that if you lengthen the time for the laser pulse, you can sort of allow heat to transfer from that hair shaft to the living cells around it. And this is back from our, when we first did this, back in the mid-90s, this is a woman with... Uh, hormonal abnormality and a lot more hair on her chest than I have on mine. Um, after two treatments with the Ruby laser, uh, she uh, has permanent hair loss here. It's interesting, the Ruby laser was the first laser ever made. And I happen to know that Fred made one when he was a kid too. Um, he actually made a working laser long before I ever did. Um, why did it take us 30 years to figure out how to do this with the world's oldest laser? The laser we did for hair removal, almost identical to Maiman's original Ruby laser. And right now, laser hair removal is the number one use of a laser in biomedical application. And the answer is it took 30 years to figure things out. I use that as an example because the, the limiting factor is not always the technology. Usually it's our ability to think through it. <laughs> That's the limiting factor. This could have been done in 1965, but it was done in 95. Here's another example. We can target um, 
pigmented cells, this little Asian boy, you can tell he's not happy with the situation. He's about to be zapped with a laser. Three years later, we can clear up his skin. He has an, a different abnormality where his melanocytes, the pigment producing cells are distributed throughout his dermis where they don't belong. This condition also affects the eye. And here he is with his eye pigmentation. I'm not going to shoot a child in the eye with a laser. He's going to wear that the rest of his life. But as far as the rest of him, he looks much better. Laser tattoo removal is another example of this. Now, if you go to Tokyo, Japan, they actually have a museum of human tattoos where they, the, the gangsters over there have big tattoos. And when they died, um, they would... I don't know whether they were donated or taken, but they, if you're curious, go to the laser tattoo museum, go, go to the human tattoo museum in, in uh, Tokyo and you'll see some gorgeous artwork. Um, this is an example of, of laser tattoo removal where you have a short pulse of light tuned to the, be absorbed by the tattoo ink and you get a about 75% of the time we can re remove the tattoo with no scarring. This, by the way, early example, people used to take off tattoos with a laser that would just vaporize the skin and you replace the tattoo with a burn scar. So that's, this is the old way, this is the new way. So I'm gonna, the last example of uh, the selective targeting is for treatment of acne. Uh, acne is a real common disease, a disorder um, that affects about 80% of people at some time in their lives. And a lot of women have it all the way till menopause. The acne is due to the activity of this oil gland, which is part of the hair follicle. Uh, it's called the sebaceous gland. And there's a bacterium that eats this oil. There's even a spider that eats it. And honestly, I, I shouldn't scare you all, but your hair follicles are close to being a sewer. There's all kinds of stuff that lives off sebum, right? And um, causes inflammation and immunology. And that's what gives you the inflammatory lesions of acne. I think of acne as um, a problem where the sebaceous hair follicles are in the act of committing suicide. That's, that's why you get the scarring and so forth. So, Having worked on laser hair removal, we asked the question, well, why can't we destroy this gland? Maybe it's just another part of the hair follicle. And is there a target um, that absorbs light? And the answer is yes, there is. Uh, it's the lipids themselves. This is the molecular structure of a, of a fat molecule called squalene that's unique to the sebaceous gland. And all these carbon hydrogen bonds have absorption at, and we chose this wavelength here, 1726 nanometers. It's in the infrared part of the spectrum. And we had this worked out on paper, but there was no laser there. You couldn't do the experiment um, until I met this guy, Fred Dilla, who had made a free electron laser there's the free electron laser that Fred made. Here he is in the pub, the first publication about this, which look at, look at this, 10 years ago, Fred. Um, it took us that long. And by the way, the first author here, Fernanda Sakamoto, is my wife. This was like one of the best studies we ever did. <laughs> so flying into Newport News, Virginia, if you look out the window at the right time, you'll see this. This is the Jefferson National Accelerator Facility. There's a high-speed electron accelerator and a uh, superconducting magnets that bend the electrons around in this racetrack. I think it's probably that building right there that occupied is occupied with Fred Dilla's free electron laser. And we did these experiments showing in human skin with Fred's laser that indeed we could damage sebaceous glands in a selective way. There was no way back then to get a laser that fit on a desk until the invention of high power fiber laser technology. That's really why it was 10 years ago that we, it took us that long. And using that new laser technology, we could shrink the laser down, so to speak.
And I'll just show you the results. In, so in 19, excuse me, in 2023, last year, two commercially available lasers, the first lasers at the special wavelength were approved by the FDA. And I'm showing you results from the early clinical trials that were done there. Um, here's a woman with what I would call moderate acne, three months after three treatments, and then no further treatment two years later. Over 90% of the patients in these studies get this kind of a response. It's just like laser hair removal. We actually get a permanent improvement. One of the nice things is that the skin pigment melanin does not absorb at this wavelength at all. This is one of the first lasers that is really colorblind from that regard. And you can treat African-Americans like this woman here um, I think this is a big deal because acne is number one disease that occupies dermatologists. We, we have lots of drugs, but none of them are curative. Here we have a non-drug that appears to be curative, so I'm bullish on this. I'm going to skip through these because uh, Linda said I, I think I have like three minutes or something. Um, so uh, there's another form of laser that uh, we call fractional lasers that you just take a focus the laser beam and down and kind of vaporize a little channel through the skin. And why would you want to do that? Well, uh, skin and every other tissue has inherent repair capacity. If you damage it, it'll start to do wound repair. And it turns out if you damage it in a tiny wound, it will repair with no scar. Now, what about if, and if you just did one tiny wound, it would have no effect, really. But how about doing a million tiny wounds so that the tissue as a whole is pushed into a, a state of, of repairing itself? And yet, each and every little wound there can be healed without a scar. That's what fractional laser treatment is. And um, here's an example this is actually my arm that we published years ago, showing um, what these tiny little wounds, here's a hair, a single hair, and these, each wound is just barely bigger than a human hair, but there are literally millions of them that we do. A big and pleasant surprise here was that scars actually, uh, and this is an example of a child who was caught in a fire and has a pretty horrendous thick burn scar. Um, scars, when tickled this way, have the ability to repair themselves toward normal. And you can see here in this uh, case and many other cases, this was actually part of a five-year prospective study that shows that you can use fractional lasers to really normalize scars. I'm gonna end my talk by saying some other stuff that I, I just, all of these capabilities, we do them in, in the United States, but how about the rest of the world? Um, in Armenia, there was a hydrogen explosion that um, simultaneously burned uh, more than 100 children and overwhelmed their care system. And those who survived um, had horrendous burns. I mean, they, were, they literally had raining, burning rubber dropped on them from the sky. Um, one of my colleagues here is an Armenian and said, well, hey, let's go over. We've got this laser now. We know that we can improve burn scars. Let's go to Armenia and help them. I said, sure, why not? <laughs> so off we go. Um, and you can see in this case, you know, the fingers are scarred together. Uh, it's very difficult for that hand to move because the scars are stiff. Uh, they had a watch on, right? There's normal skin. Look at this thick, you know, really wrong. And Here's my Armenian friends, Lilith and Ray. We're over there treating these kids the first time we went. Um, and uh, I, I, I love doing this. I love going around the world helping other people's children. Um, and uh, we established a clinic there in Yerevan, Armenia. I've been there twice, but um, actually tomorrow morning, I have an online training session with them. I can't go to Armenia now because they're having a war. Um, but I'm um, very happy to say that a lot of those kids have been helped uh, tremendously. When the second time I was over there, 
that you go outside the states and you just see stuff um, that you wouldn't see here. This little girl traveled by train all the way from Moscow uh, because she has a birthmark. And she was treated um, with an old laser the wrong way. You see this big burn scar? That was made by an inappropriate laser. 30, more than 30 years ago, we came up with that dye laser I told, I told you about. And stuff like this just breaks my heart. So we're really, I'm, my hobby right now is taking care of other people's kids. And this is my last slide. When you go halfway around the world, people figure out that you're only there uh, to help your kids. All those barriers go away. The politics, language, religion. Um, and for me, that's really what makes this worthwhile. So I'm going to end there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fred and Linda, and ask me anything and suggest anything. And um, let's chat. You can do it. Okay. Rox, that was fabulous. And you hit one of the ones I wanted you to, which was the micro dots. That's one that's been used frequently that you talk about. So Fred's got some good questions here that we can uh, pose to you. And then I have like 15 more. Oh, great. <laughs> so one of them is a gentleman that's online was served in the embassy and the mile high town of Windhoek, Namibia. And he was told that there was a higher chance of skin cancer there because of its altitude. How does one mile make that much of a difference? That's a great question. So as I mentioned, it's the UVB part of the spectrum. Um, and the UVB is attenuated not only by the ozone layer, but also by scattering. You look up at the sky and it's blue. Um, it's even... If you could see in the UV, it'd be UV because that's where the most of the scattering goes. So I think there's also aerosols besides the atmospheric scattering. So I think the higher you go, the more UVB there is. Um, I don't think there's much of a change in the ozone concentration, but um, that I'm not an expert at. But um, certainly at high altitudes, you ought to wear a UVB blocking sunscreen. Exactly. How is, is vertiligo in your mix at all? Do you work on that particular problem? Yeah, vitiligo is the name of a, of a disorder where there's, there's two flavors of vitiligo. Most of people have this autoimmune disease. And what, it, what, what the deal is, is they have really white skin. They've lost their melanocytes in patches of skin. And it's most obvious in dark skinned people. You'll see someone, you probably see them on the streets even where they have white spots on them. Um, uh, and yes, we work on that. The other form of vitiligo is a, a congenital form of vitiligo where the melanocytes just didn't develop properly. Um, one of my wacky inventions uh, uh, that's now in the hands of 3M um, is a way of moving your epidermis around in a harmless way so we can actually harmlessly steal pigmented epidermis from one place and move it to the non-pigmented part of your skin to repopulate it there's also drugs now there's a new so-called jack inhibitors that are are useful for vitiligo so back to um nf which is that interesting gene disease would that be a candidate for gene therapy at some point since it's such a big honking gene or is there just not enough money to st study every gene related disease oh no there's 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 a guy at, at stanford who's done a really great job of moving uh, of doing gene therapy for the the very first uh gene therapy for skin disease was approved by the FDA within the past year. That's for a different disease where the kids called epidermal mm -hmm. mucosa. But I, it's interesting. I spoke with him yesterday, uh, just brainstorming about exactly your question, um, whether it would be possible. What he does is he uses a, a herpes virus uh, 
which uh, gets into the skin and delivers whatever gene you put in it. And so it's a gene delivery tool. Um, and we were chatting about whether this could be used for not only it's the disease he got his approval for, but sort of broadening it out. It's not easy for neurofibroma ptosis. Uh, and the, the reason for that is that um, the, the genetics are all over the place, variability. But we agreed we would give it a shot. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of, of not even remembering the guy's name properly on the, on the fly here. But since I only talked to him, Yesterday, I'm going to look it up for you. But anyway. So uh, while you do that, let me ask about glaucoma. Is, it would, is there a laser treatment that would help that or is? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of the things that, that selective photothermolysis is used for, very useful for is early stage glaucoma. Um, the uh, treatment is done around the so-called limbus, the edge of your iris. Um, is where the cells that filter, the, they're sort of like the outflow tract of the fluid in your eye. And uh, laser treatment there, selective laser treatment against pigment selective, um, drops the intraocular pressure very nicely. I was blown away to learn that 80 million people get that treatment. Um, it's extremely popular treatment compared with eye drops for early stage glaucoma. For late stage glaucoma, there's it's a more difficult problem if the disease has progressed, and there are laser treatments that are done there, but they're sort of more heavy handed. You actually have to interfere with the way the fluid is created in the eye. Um, just to follow on to that, people who have retinal detachment, I know they're now using lasers to somehow reattach that retina back to the back of the eye. How does that work and why doesn't it damage the seeing part of your vision? Well, it does damage the seeing part of your vision. Okay. Yeah. But you have two eyes and your brain is taking signals from both of them. So, for example, we all have a really big blind spot, just, just lateral for each eye. But those two don't line up and your brain goes, oh, I'll just fill that in. So the, the way the laser works for retinal detachment is literally welding. The, it's, it's heating up the retina and the tissue underneath it, and they get hot and sticky, the proteins. It's like cooking an egg. It's exactly like cooking an egg. <laughs> proteins that are fluid, when cooked, turn solid. And then that sticks the retina back down it gets repaired and you get a little scar there. Now you have a blind spot, but your other eye fills in and your brain doesn't even notice. <laughs> that's that's interesting. Um, the Back to the lasers treating acne. Since it's so new, are the lasers just now getting into the marketplace? I assume they've got a long way to go. One of the questions is, is, is it widespread? Could we get it here? I guess would be another one of the questions. And how long is it going to be? Yeah, that's great, great questions. I, I think there's probably about 100 or 200 of those lasers peppered across the United States now. Very many. Um, and that sounds like a lot, but that's only two per state, right? And uh, uh, typically like these lasers that we use for Fort Weinstein's, um, any town over the size of about 10,000 has at least one. I think yeah. for acne, the need is even stronger than that. So it's, it is, to answer the question, it is early. Um, and I expect to see also, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the first hybrid cars and then electric cars. And th there'll be some improvements in the technology as it rolls out, but it's here to stay. And I think it's going to be very useful. Guessing, is it a very expensive treatment? That's a great question. I don't actually know the answer. My suspicion is it's at, it's probably not paid for at all by insurance right now. The devices themselves are somewhere between, you know, fifty and $150,000, right? And physicians have to recoup that. But 
um, I, my guess is that the treatments are somewhere around 500 to 1,000, something like that. I don't quote me on that because I, I have no idea, but um, the, the best data that we have suggests that it takes three or four treatments. So you, if you're the kind of person that hates your acne and you and it's worth that to you, you know, it's, it's probably a, my car analogy may be appropriate here. It's less expensive than a new car, maybe about the same as a used one by the time you add it up. And, and in some children, it is so disfiguring that it affects their self-esteem. The treatments they have affect their liver. So there are some cases where I think it's it's absolutely critical to just help a kid get yeah, on with his life. Exactly. You know, I didn't mention that, but when you see a patient, you're seeing one patient. Everybody's different. We all have different needs physically, psychologically, and there's multiple reasons to have acne. Uh, uh, so a common antidepressant really causes it, drives it crazy. So it's good to have more than one treatment. I think these lasers are going to have their sweet spot in the adult women who have acne with their menstrual cycles all the way until they're like 40 something, right? That drugs don't work for them very well. And this appears to do a pretty good job. Yeah, menopause helped me. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have one last question. And personally, we we do this. You, I asked you a long time ago, what's the best sunscreen? And you said, Linda, it's not sold in this country. And still, I go through Heathrow and buy what you told me to buy. Has that changed? You said at the time there was an FDA additive that we weren't allowed to put in our sunscreens here in the country. Yeah, it may have changed, but I my advice to the general public is that I don't have a favorite sunscreen. What I found is I, I'm glad to hear your story, Linda, because you know I recommend a sunscreen, and then people come back and say I don't like the way it smells. It's too greasy, you know. Oh come on. Or, yeah, so um, you know there are there are almost all the sunscreens that are on the market are good for somebody, or they wouldn't be on the market very long. Okay. So how's that for a non-answer? <laughs> Let me add to that on uh, your interesting comments about vitamin D. We all need vitamin D. I thought you had some wonderful remarks about the benefits of sitting near a regular glass window and keep your mushrooms on the, the shelf to get a little sunshine. So what are your other recommendations in terms of getting enough vitamin D? Oh, I think the these are... I'm glad you asked that. The worst thing is if you're a female post-menopause, you're in negative calcium flux, all right? And you got osteoporosis. Guess who needs vitamin D more than anybody else? It's older women. And they are the same ones who wear sunscreen all the time. They, particularly if they're in like, God forbid, you have to go to a nursing home or be for some, some long stay in the hospital. You gotta, if you're not outside, then you have to get the dietary, dietary source of vitamin D. And you can take it externally, you know, you know to about 2000 units a day is kind of what you would need. Um, so you can eat your vitamin D, um, but it's, uh, it's really important to pay attention to that. I mean, there's a lot of people that die of hip fracture um, because they trip and fall and now they're They've got a real problem on their hands that could have been prevented. Um, I, I'm a dermatologist who says it's okay not to wear sunscreen if you're out for a short period of time. Certainly, uh, in the the when the sun is um, greater than twenty degrees from its zenith, that means the first half of the morning, second half of the afternoon. There's much less of the UVB in there. It's enough to get you some vitamin D, but not enough to really cause much of a problem. So I, I think the best time to wear sunscreen is if, if you're going to be out in the middle of the day, yeah, wear it. If not, think about it. Yep. So, okay. no, we'll leave it on that good yeah. advice, right? Yeah. So I hope everyone has learned something by Rox. If you can imagine walking from one lab to the next, and listening to his colleagues talk for an hour or more about what they do, and then getting to cherry pick the stories you want to tell 
all of them have these kinds of impacts. And it's been our pleasure to know him and to sit and listen to these two scientists just sit and talk to each other about science. You kind of have to zone out after a while because it gets a little, <laughs> a little hairy, but it's not too bad. So I want to invite everybody to unmute themselves and give a round of applause to Rox for his very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next month. Oh, Fred, 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 for you, you too, Fred. We wouldn't have this acne laser if it weren't for Fred Dilla. Hey, Fred. Hey, Fred. Hey, Fred. We don't have time to tell the pig part of the story, but it's a good part of the story. <laughs> oh, later, later. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we won't do that part. Uh, okay, Rebecca, your turn. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We hope you have a great evening. Good night now. Good